and hello TOK. Welcome to class number 21. This is the first part of our unit on slavery and identity. Today we're going to be looking at a United States Supreme Court decision, Dred Scott v. Sanford. Um, this is this is an interesting case. Uh, it has a lot to do with humanity and what it means to be human. Um, you're going to find yourself tested, I think, in a couple of, of, uh, of different ways during this exploration as you decide what do you know and how do you know it. So let's get right to the work. What do you know? So as I mentioned, the unit is Slavery and Identity. Uh, this is designed to bring us to our, our uh, next film study. Our next film study will be the film Blade Runner. But before we get there, we need to talk about Dred Scott. Before we begin our discussion, you're going to need some background on the Supreme Court case and on the man behind it, Dred Scott. Uh, I've linked here and in our classroom assignment to a YouTube video by Quimby. Uh, it's just under five minutes long, and it does a really nice job of summarizing Dred Scott. Uh, for those of you interested in the United States history, constitutional government, um, civil rights, or uh, the struggle for equality in humans uh, in modern times, it's definitely worth investigating. Dred Scott v. Sanford is the Supreme Court case. Uh, the Supreme Court actually has a website which has breakdowns of important cases. Uh, this is something that I strongly encourage you to research on your own. It's one of those things where knowledge of this particular case will find broad application in understanding uh, the United States Civil War, the Civil Rights Movement, and the concept of race as a legal structure in the United States, and by extension, to Western democracy. Okay, so I'm, I'm hoping that you've taken some time to watch the video, to think about it, maybe do some additional research on your own. But I want to ask not about the details of Dred Scott, but what the Scott decision tells us about ourselves. Because although it is widely viewed as one of the most disastrously misguided uh, decisions of the Supreme Court uh, in the United States history, there's some something unexamined, something, um, a presupposition in Scott that black Americans are fundamentally different from white Americans. And regardless of how the court came down on this decision, there wasn't any serious discussion as to whether or not there was a equality on the subject of race. The question was, what is the appropriate treatment under the law for black Americans? But the idea that blackness, that whiteness, that race itself as a social construct had limitations in its application to the bright line decision making uh, of the courtroom was never really challenged. Now today we have a much more nuanced view of race and ethnicity. We view uh, race and ethnicity as being part of a broad socially defined spectrum of characteristics, some of which are inherently valuable, some of which are contextually valuable, and some of which have far outlived their social usefulness. Um, but we do still recognize that there are important differences in lived experience. Uh, anyone who believes that, that because race is a social construct, it is therefore unimportant, uh, has a rude shock awaiting her uh, in today's society. Okay, I want you to think about, in theory of knowledge terms, in terms of ways of knowing, uh, I want you to think about 
the way race is embedded in our political, economic, cultural, and artistic lives. I want you to think, how do you learn about race? Is it primarily through observation, uh, personal experience? Is it through a uh, recorded history? Uh, is it something you learn about in school? Is it something that is steeped so deeply in your culture that it is part of our uh, part of our geopolitical, ethnic, cultural, American experience? Or is there something else? Is there a component of, of faith, of intuition, of emotion? Um, and think not just the things you've been told about race, but moments of racial awareness that you've had. When you saw something you thought, this makes me feel included, or this makes me feel like an outsider. This seems fair. This seems not to be unfair. This, this seems to be unfair. It seems to be um, discriminatory or persecutory, uh, persecutory in some way. Um, I want you to think about how we think about race. And then I want you to watch another film uh, clip. This is a YouTube video by Spike Lee in which he discusses and dismisses the existence or the idea of a post-racial America. Uh, you guys are pretty much too young for this, but when uh, Barack Obama was elected president, there were a lot of well-meaning, highfalutin, deeply introspective articles published mostly by white liberals uh, asking if we now lived in a post-racial society, if we now lived in a society where the concept of race was no longer uh, the issue that it had been in our society. And I think Spike Lee does a pretty good job of addressing this in his, his clip following. Okay, now, as you watch the video from Spike Lee, I want you to pay extra careful attention to the actions and reactions of the audience. There are several times when he asks a, a, a rhetorical question or he asks a direct question of the audience and there's a lot of hedging and a lot of humming and hawing until he challenges them, at which point some hands are sheepishly raised or some people, yeah, yeah. Um, what does that say about the way that we learn and know in social situations as a group as compared to individuals. How is our membership in a group, even something as simple as and temporary as an audience for an interview, how does that modify our understanding as knowers? Oh, and... Uh, Spike Lee's inter video interview is uh, approximately eight minutes long. Okay. So the question becomes, can we imagine a world without race, without the social construction of ethnicity determined by heredity? Uh, what would happen in a non-racial or, or post-racial world? Um, would we continue to see the same prejudices simply shifted to new targets? Or would there be a fundamental realignment in our conception of ourselves? I want you to think about this as you watch this interview with actor Kevin Costner. Um, he openly admits to growing up in a context, in a world where, where race was assumed to have importance and where particular races were viewed as superior or inferior to one another, and having to challenge those built-in assumptions as he, as he grew to adulthood. Uh, this video is only about four minutes long, um, and it references several times his film, Black and White. Um, I have not seen the film. It got mixed reviews. Some people said it was very good. Some people said it was uh, too earnest and too serious and you know, had elements of, of liberal white guilt. Um, again, I haven't seen it. You'll have to watch it yourselves and report back. Uh, if you have seen this film, do please share out with us what you thought. 
Uh, but again, please watch the video with Kevin Costner. Link is on the following page. Okay, and as you watch the video, uh, please note the film that I mentioned, Black or, it's actually Black or White, not Black and White, um, which is an interesting title difference as it assumes that there is a choice to be made. Um, I'd love to do an exploration sometime of titles and how titles can influence our view of created works, but that's really something for another time, another day. Um, watch Mr. Costner's interview on CNN and tell us, uh, share with us what you think, think about it yourself, uh, about a four minute interview. Okay, for our final reflection, uh, our final video clip here, I wanna talk about an important concept called cognitive dissonance. And cognitive dissonance is the condition that, that occurs when you try to hold opposing views or concepts in your mind consciously at the same time. Uh, say, for example, that someone close to you was injured uh, in an accident, um, a careless accident. Someone wasn't looking at what they were doing. They were texting and they, uh, they moving at low speed with their car, knocked down your, your loved one. And fortunately, no one was seriously injured, but you're torn because at the one side, you want to be happy that everything worked out. You want to be glad that your loved one wasn't seriously injured you want to be angry at the person, and yet you recognize that a large number of people drive distractedly and that it is a problem and that many of us, whether we want it to be true or not, under oath would have to admit to having engaged in, in distracted driving um, or, or similar dangerous behaviors at some point in our lives. You can believe that you forgive the person who did this for what they've done and also believe that they deserve to be punished. Now, those individual ideas you can get behind, yet they are in conflict with one another. This causes a certain amount of cognitive dissonance. I don't know how to think about this. I don't know how to feel. You can simultaneously feel multiple things. One of the ways that we deal with cognitive dissonance is through humor. Humor is one way that we have developed as social animals. It is an evolved response to pain or fear. Um, one of the classic definitions of, of humor, uh, tragedy is when something terrible happens. Humor is when something terrible happens to someone else. Well, Saturday Night Live is theoretically a humor show. Um, its humor is very hit or miss, as you would expect from a live comedy show that's been running for decades. But uh, some time ago, they had a sketch in which they held up the utopia of liberal white middle class America of New England, Vermont, with the stereotypes of Southern racism and white nationalism and wound up arguing that one of the most liberal places in America is a, quote, Caucasian paradise. So I'd like you to watch the following clip and hopefully get a laugh. Okay, as you watch this clip, I want you to be thinking about two things. One, is it funny? And two, why is it funny? What pain or discomfort is being subverted or avoided here uh, to generate to the humor? Or does the humor stem from something else completely? And here you can see the sources for all of the videos linked <coughs> previously. Uh, these are also available on our class website as clickable links. And I thank you very much for your investigation into the concept of 
race and identity, um, how slavery and the decision of Dred Scott v. Sanford has impacted America today. Okay, this brings us to the end of lesson number 21. I thank you, as always, for your work, and I would just like to say, please, please, stay safe, be well.